you love the Lord, say amen. amen. If you're a witness that God is a good God, say amen again. Amen. If you've been electrified already tonight, say amen one more time. God is a sure enough good God. God, I'm fishing for a witness. God is a good God. I ought not have to fish so long. God is a good God. If you judge him by his height, you'll find there's none his size. If you put him in a grave, he'll surely rise. He can walk on the water and not get wet. You can put him in a fire, he won't even sweat. He's a good God. He fed the thousands who did not have bread. He brought people back from the dead. Drove out demons from the demon bound and taught us how to walk on holy ground. He made the leper skin like new. Storms dissipated when he told it to. Took jars of water, turned it into wine, even saved this soul of mine. He's a good God. And if your God ain't working tonight, you ought to show enough try my God. He's a good God. I'm thankful to the omnipotent and the omniscient and the omnipresent God we serve. Thankful to this great lectureship under the auspices of uh, Brother Larry Williams and Brother Curtis Johnson. What a magnanimous and superb job they've done. Give them a hand of praise. I, we certainly appreciate the accommodations and the program and the excellent spirit that has been pervasive in this week-long uh, series of lectures of the Church of Christ. I'm also indebted to these great men who've come before me. You made my job so easy tonight. One of my sons, Elijah, and of course my best friend, Xerxes Snell, and that great preaching machine, uh, Alvin Daniels. You see, uh, Brother Williams, I don't know if he even knew what he was doing in his uh, infinite wisdom. There's a discipline he followed tonight. You'll find in John chapter 2, Jesus' first miracle in Canaan of Galilee. He turned water into wine. Do you not know the, the custom was in ancient Palestinian days uh, that at a wedding feast, they always bought the best wine first? Okay. And after everyone was intoxicated and inebriated, they sprung on them the bad wine. And because they were already high, they didn't notice how bad. <laughs> Y'all already drunk on the word of God. Y'all leaning and singing, nobody knows the trouble I see. You already high on the word. Now this bad wine ain't going to look so bad. And I'm just indebted, just glad to be on the same team. Listen, I want to thank you all publicly for your prayers and support as I went through my storm. Uh, and many of you know I had a, a minor stroke on last year about this time, and God brought me up, brought me out, brought me through. And I'm sure enough grateful. Now, uh, you may not help me, so I, you know, I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't argue with people no more. You don't bother me about my praise. Uh, you were not there, you don't know you were not there. <laughs> you don't know when and you don't know where. And uh, God brought me up, and I'm thankful for it. And uh, if you don't, I uh, want to say amen tonight. I heard my best friend say, if God be for me, <laughs> then who can be against me? Uh, I've been assigned a uh, sermonic thrust tonight. Lord, don't move my mountain. And the hallway from whence we will walk tonight, if you allow me to summon your senses and invite your intellect, let us investigate 2 Corinthians chapter 12. We're launching verse number 7. It is a a uh, well-known piece of sacred literature that we have uh, put under the crucible of investigation on many occasions in our fellowship. But tonight, uh, let us look at it from the theme, Lord, don't move the mountain. Uh, Paul, the prolific personality of the New Testament, writes uh, his second admonition to the church uh, at Corinth, in verse number 7 of chapter 12, he says, and, and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above. He explains already why the devil is attacking him. He was rising above where the devil wanted him to be. And church, any time you're ascending, you'll be attacked by the enemy. It's good news when you're under attack. You must be doing something the devil don't like. Uh, if the devil ain't bothering you, you already got the memo. That means he's already got you. 
uh, quit, quit bragging about how mature you are and how you've grown. That just means you ain't doing much. Because any time you climb Jacob's ladder, there's always somebody at the bottom trying to say amen with your cap. You know how we are like crabs. Any time one crab tries to get out of the barrel, instead of you helping him out so he can maybe help you get out, we ain't got no better sense than to try to... Paul going to say, for this thing, whatever this thorn was, I besought God three times. He's like Lionel Richard, once, twice, three times a begging. He said that it might depart from me. And then we hear from God. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I'd rather glory in my infirmities. Somebody need to baker act this man. I, I'm happy about my trouble. When is the last time somebody came down at the invitation and said, I just want to thank God for all this trouble I'm having. We think they have a psychological disorder. But Paul says, I glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities. In my mountains, he said, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecution, in distresses, for Christ's sake. And here is the coup de grace. For when I am weak, then I'm strong. Lord, don't move my mountain. The record is clear. The great apostolos of old Paul pins this letter to the church and saints at Corinth. This, this epistolary that I believe to be amongst the greatest valedictories of the New Testament, Paul has learned some theology that he did not ascertain at the school of the rabbis at the University of Damascus. He did not learn this discipline in his graduate studies at the feet of his mentor, Gamaliel. What he does for us tonight is expose the colossal titanic struggle uh, between our flesh and our spirit. Look at what he said. Look at the lexicon. Look at the language. Look at the verbiage he uses. When I am weak, then I am strong. On surface, it seems oxymoronic. It is, it is a conundrum. It's a didactic contrast. It's a mystery wrapped inside of an enigma. But what he really does for us is provide the common denominator for all men. And now he's on the level that is homogeneous and homogeneous that everybody tonight can understand in my life, in your life, everybody's got a thorn in the flesh. I love the fact that even though he's an apostle who penned half of the New Testament, he's honest enough to admit he's got some mountains and some thorns in the flesh. This man who was once the chief of sinners, who became the greatest of the apostles, said, I got a thorn in the flesh. This man who spread the gospel from Palestine to Asia Minor to Europe to Northern Africa said, I got a thorn in the flesh. This man who had a vision from heaven that was better than John the Revelator's vision on the Isle of Patmos. He said it was so great, it was unlawful for him to utter. He said, I got a thorn in the flesh. And if Paul had a thorn in the flesh, if Paul had a mountain, if Paul had a situation, if Paul had circumstances, then I know good and God well, you and I got some. You get on my nerve acting like it ain't nothing bothering you. Like you don't deal with some thorns in your flesh. Uh, he's saying, I made a request to God. Tiptoe, uh, walk with me through the text. He said, I requested of God three times that he removed this thorn. Because that thorn is holding me back from progressing in the body of Christ. Now many scholars, Brother Tucker and theologians have debated for years what that thorn was. 
Speculation abounds, but we really don't know, and we'll have to wait till we get to heaven to ask Paul what that thorn really was. Many believe it was a physical malady, a disease or affliction in his mortal body. We base that on uh, Galatians 4.13 when Paul said, uh, how, You know how through infirmity of the flesh I preach the gospel unto you. Some folk believe he had bad eyesight, uh, glaucoma, cataract, optic nerve difficulty. And they believe that was born out of his experience on the Damascus Road when he was riding along on his donkey, had gone down to the magistrate's office, got letters of authority, arrest warrants to uh, bind Christians and bring them back to Jerusalem. You remember there was a, a light shone down from heaven and the effulgence of the light knocked him off his beast, blinded him, and God sent him down to the street street church of Christ where Ananias baptized him and we based that on Galatians 4 15 when he said to the Galatians I bear record if it were possible you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me then he went on in Galatians 6 11 uh, for the evidence we think it's the eye problem because he said see how I wrote this letter uh, in large print in my own hand Others surmise it was a problem of lust, desire. One of the sisters had caught his eye. And every time he tried to preach, he just couldn't get that red ball off his mind. I wish I had a church in here. I don't care what you say. Everybody's got a thorn. I tell you what, everybody's got a thorn. I said everybody. I'm glad, I'm glad God didn't reveal the thorn because he would have told us if you identified with it, everybody else, you would have said it was on their way to hell. But since he didn't tell us, God covered everybody by saying, my grace is sufficient. I tell you what, everybody's got one tonight. You want me to tell, you want me to tell you mine? You go first. <laughs> say amen when you can. I, I said everybody's got a thorn. Some believe his thorn was over there in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 when he enumerated and pontificated on several difficulties he possessed. Paul said, I was shipwrecked. Paul said, I was beaten. I was in prison. He said, I received 40 lashes minus one, claiming his citizenship as a, as a, as a citizen of Rome that he could only receive 39 lashes. Paul said, I was in weakness, pain, and peril, and persecution. They let me over a wall in a basket. He walked 20 miles and preached again the next day. I don't know what it was, but God answered by saying, my grace. God himself makes the case for grace. And Paul's request to God was, move my mountain. Take away this thorn in the flesh. But God explains through his case for grace that you can only be great if you go through trials and tribulations. God told Ananias to tell Paul in Acts chapter 9 verse 16, show him what great things he must suffer for the cause of Christ. You remember in Luke's gospel, chapter 22, verse 31, Jesus said to Peter and the disciples, Satan desires to have you and sift you as sweet. And God allowed him to do so. But Jesus said, but I prayed for you that you might be strengthened. I came by to tell you, God's not going to move your mountain. But in his infinite wisdom, he'll give you the strength to climb. In the text, Paul said, listen, listen, God, take it away. He pleaded again and again, Lord, hurry up and move this thorn, this mountain in my flesh. But he must have, he must have heard what my grandmama used to sing. When grandma used to say, uh, you can't hurry God. Oh no, you just got to wait. You got to trust and give him time. He's a God you can't hurry. He'll be there, don't you worry. He may not come when you want him to come. But anybody in here like to know he's always on time. He's an on-time God. Yes, he is. 
uh, uh, you, you, you don't need your mouth just to be moved. God said, my strength is made perfect in you. You will never be strong if God took away all of your mouth. No pain, no gain. Grandmama said, anything that don't kill you, I'll make you stronger. So quit asking God to move stuff. Just ask God to give you the power to endure what you're going through. Because one thing about going through stuff, through has an has a interest and an exit. What you don't want to do is stop. It's all right to go through. James said it this way in James 1 and 2. Count it all joy when you fall into different temptations. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith work in patience. God knocks you down so you will have enough sense then to look up. We had some bad information when I was in school, Dr. White. Teacher told us shortest distance between two points is a straight line. But God don't always take us in a straight line. I wish I had a church in here. Sometimes God takes us a long way around. Zigzag pattern, a curvy pattern. I found out if you always go straight through, when you go straight across, when you get across, sometimes you got to pick up across. So God will lead you around trouble. So when you get there, you'll be safe and sound. You see, beloved, God never moved those mountains in ancient Palestine. Mount Sinai is still there. Mount Nebo is still there. Mount Zion is still there. There's good news, though, when you got a mountain. By, by de facto, if there's mountains around, there's got to be a valley somewhere. All you got to do is have the strength to climb your mountain, and God will give you peace in your valleys. You see, see we, we, we're looking for all this great theology and, and all this great revelation and a new word from God. If you just had enough sense to see in his simplicity how God, look, look, okay, I'll tell you how simple God is. I, I was watching TV. This is how simple God is. I, I, I'm a huge Sanford and Son fan. Okay, when the marathon come on, I record it all. And I've seen every episode 28 times, but I still laugh at Fred, Lamont, and Esther. In, but I love the Barracuda. Uh, I see y'all been watching Sam and his son, too. Uh, uh, Bubba and all, uh, uh, and, 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 and Rollo, because Rollo is just like my cousin, and you got one like that. And now since my church is, as, as multicultural, uh, Julio's there. <laughs> Say amen when you can. But, but I saw something the other day, Daniels, I never said. The gospel is right there in San Francisco. Been watching it for 40 years. Never saw it. I, the gospel is right there. Because all Sanford and Son is, is a story about a father who sends his son out to get trashed, bring it back so he can clean it up and put it back on the market. Okay, y'all miss your shot. All the story is, is about a father who sends his son out to get trash, bring it back so he can clean it up and put it back on the market. Y'all miss it one more time. All the gospel is, is a story about a father who sent his son to get some trash, clean it up, and put it back on the market. That's all the gospel is. So the next time you watching Sanford and Son, thank God for the gospel. Preach, Leonard. Where I'm from, folks say amen. You see, while we are praying for strength, what we don't recognize is what we really is praying for is trouble. Say amen when you can. Because your strength is made perfect in your weakness. You will never be strong until God puts you through something. Say amen when you can. You see, see, we preachers complain all the time about the members that's giving us trouble. Lord, thank you for them troublemaking members that keep me climbing the mountain. Now, I got too many of them. And I'm willing to ship some of them to you expense free. I'll pay their postage. I'll pay their travel. I'll get an Atlas van line. I'll pay their front, turn their lights on, turn their water on, turn their, I'll pay their first and last month rent, but it's a one-way ticket. They can't come back. Say amen with that. But don't get rid of all your mountains.
in Genesis 50, we find Joseph responding to his brethren. And you ain't never been hurt till somebody close to you hurts you. Okay, and you don't care what the Ku Klux Klan think about you. Say it, you can. But, but when your brethren, brethren, our doubt as children of the same womb, and in the church of Christ, we be brethren. And you ain't never been hurt to somebody who's supposed to be your brother. Now, now some of our mountains we make ourselves. It ain't a mountain you just made it. A mountain. I, I was, listen, uh, Brother White, uh, about 30 years ago, uh, uh, I, I got a 28-year-old son. He's 28, and my daughter's 23, before she was born. So I know it was about 25 years ago. I was preaching in Tallahassee, Florida, Spring Hill Road Church of Christ, and I never forget, brought my wife and family down to Disney World, uh, and this is how we sometimes make mountains where there ain't no mountain. Uh, sometime in the church, we preaching about stuff, ain't nobody even thinking about you. Ain't nobody laughing at you. Ain't nobody picking at your dress. Ain't nobody, you, you done made that a problem when it ain't no problem. The guilty flee when nobody pursues. Yeah. Amen. You, you got low self-esteem, so anybody that got high self-esteem, you get mad at them. They ain't thinking about you. They going about their business, but since you insecure, you want to make it about you. It ain't about you. I, I went to Disney World. Now, this is my son, three years old. He's 28 years old now. And I, listen, I'm, I'm uncouth. I'm, I'm a country boy from Tallahassee. I didn't know Disney characters. All I know is my wife said, if we're going to be in we need to take them to Disney World every now and then. And we was in Tallahassee. Now, when I moved to Atlanta, I ain't never been. But when I was living out of town, uh, we went down there. Now, we got a place for a week. And we at the Disney parade. I took my three years old, put him on my shoulder. He couldn't see. And so I put him on my shoulder. And he's hollering at the Disney. And somebody behind me hollers, hey, Tigger. Now, now, I listen. I don't know Disney characters. <laughs> okay, y'all not hear what I'm saying? This guy behind me, who's from Europe, say, "Hey, Tigger!" Now, y'all know who Tigger is, right? But I didn't know who Tigger was. I thought this dude. I put my son down, got him from a tippy toe. I say, ain't nothing between us but space and opportunity. And my wife had to grab him. She said, no, 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 no. That yonder he is. He's the tiger. I made a mountain where there was no mountain. I made a problem. I was about to go to jail over nothing. And some of us in the church will make a problem. Ain't nobody talking about you. Every sermon you hear, you think, you, I tell my members, do you really think you that important? I sit up three or four hours to write a sermon about you. You have a distorted view of yourself. I might hit you in passing. But I did not sit down with you in mind. Say amen when you can. You making a mountain in your marriage, in your ministry, in your life, in your family, on your job. Sometimes we make mountains where there are no mountains. Joseph brethren heard him in Genesis, but he concluded in Genesis 50. You meant it for evil. See, see, God takes your mountain. Quit looking at mountains as a burden. It's a place of elevation. People don't ever talk about the deepest valley. We talk about the tallest mountain. L -l 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 Listen, Joseph said, y'all meant it for evil, but God. He said, that pit you put me in led me to the prison, but God elevated me to the palace. Job had a mountain. The devil attacked him with God's permissive will. But Job came to the conclusion, though he slayed me, yet will I trust him. 